Good afternoon and welcome to the City Club of Cleveland. My name is Paul Harris and I am president of the City Club's Board of Directors. During its almost 99-year history of inspiring, educating, and informing, the City Club has invited a number of renowned speakers to this podium to discuss issues related to the investigation and prosecution of war criminals. Today I am very pleased to extend a City Club welcome to Eli Rosenbaum, Director of the United States Department of Justice's Office of Special Investigations. Mr. Rosenbaum has led the Department's investigation and prosecution of Nazi war criminals since 1995, and in 2004 his office's responsibilities were expanded to include modern war criminals. From time to time, the City Club invites special guests to introduce our speakers, in particular where the guests are accomplished in their own right and have a special connection to the speaker. This certainly applies to today's special guest, Stephen Dettelbeck, United States Attorney for the Northern District of Ohio. Mr. Dettelbeck presented at the City Club September 24, 2010 forum, and I would like to welcome him to the podium to give a further introduction of today's speaker. Uh, I want to uh, uh, thank uh, Paul and Jim Foster for bending the rules and allowing me to introduce uh, a great member of the Department of Justice where I work, Eli Rosenbaum. Uh, you can read about Eli's uh, accomplishments in the program in front of you. You can learn that he graduated from Harvard Law School uh, and that he was the individual who has headed for now almost 30 years uh, and worked in the most successful government Nazi hunting organization on earth, end quote. Uh, but that wouldn't tell you the whole story of Eli Rosenbaum. Injustices in the world have to be corrected, and often it takes a long time and passion to correct them. They can be corrected in all sorts of ways. Recently, we saw and read about SEAL Team 6, and we hear about our, our men and women in uniform who endanger their lives to go about bringing justice to the world. And in many ways, Eli Rosenbaum's struggle and Eli Rosenbaum's passion is like that, but in some ways it is not. It is like that because he has spent his career decades honoring the pursuit of wronging a grave injustice. Uh, it is like it because he also has detractors and people who take shots at him in the, his relentless pursuit of correcting injustice. But it is unlike them because in the most American of ways, the most American of passions, Eli Rosenbaum's relentless pursuit of justice do not involve the weapons of guns and flash grenades, but pens and law books and intellect and integrity. And while people will make movies about SEAL Team 6 and write documentaries and have all sorts of attention, many of Eli Rosenbaum's struggles and accomplishments will happen in private. But make no mistake about it, Eli Rosenbaum is a hero to our community. He is a hero in the Cleveland community. He is a hero in the Jewish community. He is a hero in the law enforcement community. And he is a hero in our American community. Ladies and gentlemen, Eli Rosenbaum. I, I'm blushing. The radio audience won't see that. Uh, thank you so much, Steve, uh, for those very generous words of introduction. It's wonderful to be back uh, in the hometown of the Dallas Maverick. I, I'm sorry. I mean the amazing Cleveland Indians. Uh, what a huge privilege it is for me uh, not only to speak in this legendary venue, the City Club, but to be introduced by Steve Dettelbach, whose reputation for brilliance, tenacity, and, and truly extraordinary leadership in the pursuit of justice is well known in Washington and throughout the country. Uh, those qualities have, have been the hallmarks of, of his remarkable career in public service and of his many engagements in civic and charitable causes. Uh, the Justice Department was so fortunate to be able to lure Steve back from private practice to serve as your United States Attorney. And in that role, he has, he has taken what was already one of the nation's premier federal law enforcement operations and brought it to even greater heights of accomplishment in the areas of criminal law enforcement, civil rights, counterterrorism, just to name three of the areas in which the U.S. Attorney's Office here works so effectively every day to keep Americans safe and to protect the rights of all. Many thanks, Steve. Uh, Steve is accompanied here by another hero of mine, Assistant U.S. Attorney Michelle Heyer, 
uh, a former OSI trial attorney, I am very lucky to have been associated uh, with uh, this gifted professional for many uh, years. Uh, Michelle has won major Justice Department awards for her history-making work on the Justice Department's World War II Nazi cases, and I am so happy to have an opportunity here uh, today to salute her publicly in her hometown for her tenacious and enormously successful work in pursuit of justice on behalf of the victims of Nazi crimes against humanity. Where is Michelle? Thank you, Michelle. Uh, I, I want to be sure also to thank my very good friends at the Robert H. Jackson Center who helped arrange my appearance here today. The Jackson Center is a living monument to one of the great figures of American history, indeed of world history, uh, former Supreme Court Justice Robert H. Jackson. The worldwide impact of the Center's tireless work in, in furtherance of Justice Jackson's unique legacy in the realms of justice and human rights continues to grow by leaps and bounds. We, of course, at the Justice Department claim him as, as one of our own. He was the 57th Attorney General of the United States before being elevated to the Supreme Court and leading the American team at Nuremberg. The Nuremberg trial really was, was his, his brainchild in, in so many ways. Uh, I, I'm very grateful to Jim Foster and his talented staff here at the City Club for their many kindnesses in connection with my visit. And I especially want to thank Victor Gelb, who was clearly the, the moving force in making my appearance here today happen. The amazing uh, fruits of his decades-long leadership in philanthropy and civic activism on behalf of causes that better and, and even save people's lives are evident throughout the, the greater Cleveland area and well beyond. I challenge anyone in this room uh, or in the radio audience to name a major good cause that has not been supported by, by Vic Gelb and his lovely wife Joan. Uh, through their nearly endless good works, the Gelbs continue to help so many and to inspire people of good, goodwill all over the world. And just yesterday, by the way, uh, this wonderful couple celebrated their 63rd wedding anniversary. Isn't that great? Yeah. Speaking of anniversaries, we recently marked the one-year anniversary of the establishment of our new office at the Justice Department, the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, which was created through the merger of two components of the Justice Department's Criminal Division, my former office, OSI, and the former Domestic Security Section. Both components had handled uh, human rights violator cases, uh, OSI being by far the older of the two offices, having been created back in 1979 in response to the exposure by the media and the Congress of the shocking fact that World War II Nazi criminals had managed to find refuge in the United States and that the government was doing virtually nothing to prosecute them. At the former OSI, we knew from the start that we wouldn't have jurisdiction to prosecute these individuals criminally as there hadn't been a federal statute on the books during World War II that conferred jurisdiction on U.S. courts to try cases involving human rights crimes committed abroad. Uh, not even Nazi genocide could be prosecuted here. Uh, hence the goal uh, throughout the 32-year history of the department's reinvigorated effort to identify and take legal action against participants in World War II human rights crimes has been to remove them, remove these people, uh, either through deportation or extradition, preferably to countries that do possess the criminal jurisdiction that we lack. Uh, we usually have to bring federal suit uh, to revoke citizenship first, but ultimately removal is, is the goal, and we've accomplished that many, many times. Uh, we have to date won cases against 107 participants in Nazi crimes against humanity, and during the past two decades, we've won more such cases than have all the other governments of the world combined. Uh, that record has earned the United States the distinction of receiving the A rating of the Simon Wiesenthal Center in all of its annual reports on worldwide law enforcement uh, activities in the Nazi cases. Uh, indeed, uh, the U.S. is the only government in the world to have received that coveted rating every year, a rating that was conferred only once on, on another government, and that was Germany last year. Uh, when the former OSI was established uh, back in 1979, there was enormous initial skepticism both within and, and outside the federal government, that it was possible to prove these complex cases decades after the events in question, uh, especially in courts uh, located thousands of miles away from the scenes of the crimes. 
Uh, I was the office's first summer intern that year, uh, so I remember uh, those, those days well. I remember the challenges very well. I especially remember being told that we wouldn't have the kind of evidence that prosecutors the world over are accustomed to having when they go to court. We wouldn't have a fingerprint, a murder weapon, a preserved crime scene, a forensic report. We wouldn't even have the corpus delecti. We would, what would we have? We'd have maybe what Robert Jackson had at Nuremberg, incriminating documents that somehow survived the war to be captured by Allied forces, and perhaps, if we were lucky and if we were good, some confessions. Uh, we continue this work, by the way. It's not over. We still have several cases uh, against Nazi criminals pending in, in federal courts around, around the country. Um, contrary to popular belief, and I suppose to the Hollywood conception of this work, our prosecutions have not originated with tips from self-styled Nazi hunters, uh, from Holocaust survivors, or other members of the public. We get those tips to be sure. Uh, uh, we tend to call them, my neighbor is a Nazi. Someone will call in, <laughs> my neighbor, you know, he's the neighbor from hell to begin with, and he, he's European, he's old, he wears leather jackets, he has a German shepherd. Or uh, we've gotten a bunch, we used to get at least one a year from a divorce lawyer calling about uh, the, uh, the wife's uh, husband, uh, and also from malpractice attorneys calling about defendant physicians who hailed from Europe. Uh, but the way we've actually identified these people for most of the period in which this work has been done, uh, the very early period, it was largely tips from foreign governments uh, communicated directly uh, to us or indirectly through the media. Uh, or, or others, uh, but in general the way we've done this is by being proactive, by uh, building a database through the work of our staff historians of people who served in units that participated in the perpetration of Nazi crimes or who were wanted after the war but perhaps not found, uh, and in the end we built a database of more than 70,000 suspects of, of uh, suspected of involvement in European Nazi crimes, and also, I should add, in uh, Japanese crimes during World War II. And we have methodically run all of those names against U.S. immigration records and other domestic records in order to identify suspects who've come to this country. When we find a match, the person is alive and well, uh, then the investigation in chief begins. The goal, of course, is to determine what a suspect did during the war. Uh, in a conventional law enforcement scenario, uh, one goes from the crime or the crime scene to the perpetrator. Uh, so, for instance, there's a, a dead body uh, back in my hometown uh, uh, at the corner of Broadway and 42nd Street. Uh, the task for NYPD, uh, as uh, Agatha Christie would have posted classically, is to deduce who done it. Uh, in the Nazi cases, in contrast, we've typically gone from the perpetrator to the crime. We identify a suspect, uh, and then we attempt to ascertain what that person did during the war. Our defendants have included uh, one major level uh, official of an Axis re regime, Andrei Artukovic, the Minister of Justice and Minister of the Interior in the Nazi puppet state of Croatia. He's the only cabinet level Axis official known to have fled to the United States uh, uh, after the war. He signed decrees, which one can find at the Library of Congress in Washington, expropriating the property of Croatia's Jews, requiring Jews to wear distinctive markings on their outer clothing to identify them as Jews, and setting up a nationwide system of concentration camps. He was ultimately extradited to the former Yugoslavia, uh, convicted there and sentenced to death. Another high-profile defendant of ours was Arthur Rudolph, who was operations director of an underground V-2 missile fabrication factory that was part of the Dora Nordhausen concentration camp. Forced to work there under grotesquely inhumane conditions, large numbers of Rudolph's inmate slave laborers perished. After the war, Rudolph was brought to the United States by the U.S. government under a then secret program, and he was put to work on America's uh, missile program, and then on our nascent uh, space program. Rudolph eventually was put in charge of constructing the Saturn V rocket. Uh, it is thus a, uh, an unfortunate part of our nation's history that the rocket that took humankind to the moon in 1969 was built by a Nazi slave master. On advice of counsel, Rudolph relinquished his U.S. citizenship rather than fight us in court, and he returned to Germany. Uh, our defendants have also included what may be termed the trigger pullers of the Holocaust, the men, and also women, uh, who faced the victims and were the hands-on instrumentalities of Nazi persecution. 
One such individual was New York City resident, or uh, New York City area resident, Jacob Reimer, uh, who, when I questioned him at the U.S. Attorney's Office in Manhattan, reluctantly, very reluctantly, admitted participating in a mass shooting of Jews near Trevniki, Poland. That operation was intended, as he put it, these are his words, to exterminate a Jewish labor camp. And our defendants have included mid-level perpetrators, too, uh, the kinds of people whom uh, our uh, German colleagues call Schreibtischtäter, literally desk murderers, people who issued the lethal orders from the uh, remove of their offices. Uh, Andre, uh, Alexandris Lelakis, uh, whom we found in Norwood, Massachusetts, near Boston, was, was one such person. Uh, I vividly recall taking part in a stakeout outside his home one uh, early morning, very chilly morning, uh, along with an investigator, followed by an interview in which he insisted to me that although, yes, he had been chief of the Lithuanian security police in Nazi-occupied Vilnius, he hadn't actually had anything to do with the Jews. It was the Germans, he protested, who'd handled all aspects of the Jewish question, including the ghettoization of the Jews of Vilnius, more than 50,000 innocent civilians, men, women, children, babies, and then their systematic removal to the killing pits at the wooded hamlet of Panerai outside, uh, outside of Vilnius. And then we found documents bearing his signature and consigning Jews, among them a six-year-old girl named Fruma Kaplan, to the killing squad at Panerai. And when we did that and offered it to the court, along with other orders in which Lelakis sent Jews to their doom, his lawyers interposed the surprising defense that their client was merely, quote, a disembodied issuer of orders. I, I remember looking at that rather the way my dog looks at me, and you know, he turns his head to the side when I talk to him, trying to figure out that if he looks at me in a different way, you know, maybe he'll understand what I'm saying, and the poor guy never does. Anyway, uh, Lelakis was surely turning the Nuremberg Superior Orders defense on its head with this defense, uh, which, which actually amounted to an admission of culpability. Um, I must say, even those of us who had worked on the Nazi cases for many years were, were really shocked uh, to see a death warrant for a six-year-old girl. Uh, little Fruma Kaplan had disappeared in the maelstrom of Nazi genocide more than half a century earlier, shot to death as she and her mother Gita shivered in fear one December, facing their executioners in the bitter cold uh, at a pit in the forests of Panerai that already contained the bodies of thousands of dead and dying people who had preceded them to the killing site. Um, the terror that they experienced is unimaginable. Uh, Judge Richard Stearns of the U.S. District Court in Boston uh, revoked the Lakers' ill-gotten U.S. citizenship uh, on our motion for summary judgment. The judge found him complicit in some 50,000 murders of Jews, including those of Gita and Fruma Kaplan. Uh, I think Judge Stearns was probably as moved as we were by their fate, uh, and uh, he mentioned Fruma Kaplan in his decision. Uh, as Auschwitz survivor and Nobel laureate Elie Wiesel observed a few years ago in connection with efforts to identify victims uh, in Saddam Hussein's mass graves in Iraq, quote, the moment you give a face a name, not just to the victim, but to the killer, people respond with greater comprehension. It somehow, he said, puts limits on the phenomenon, uh, which otherwise is incomprehensible because of the numbers and the magnitude. A number of our most important cases have been prosecuted right here in, in Cleveland in partnership with the U.S. Attorney's Office. There was, for example, the case of Algimantis Dailita, who was one of Alexandris Lelakis' henchmen in Vilnius, luring Jews out of the ghetto in order to arrest them and up his arrest reports to impress the Germans and that ensured their delivery to Panerai for execution. Of course, the best known of the Cleveland, Cleveland area cases is that of John Demjanjuk, whom we deported to Germany in 2009 after nearly a decade of hard-fought litigation. Just last month, Demjanjuk was convicted of having served as an accessory to the murder of some 28,000 Jews at the Sobibor death camp in Nazi-occupied Poland. The case sort of came full circle because when originally tried, in your beautiful city in 1981, the major factual allegations were that he uh, participated in Nazi-sponsored acts of persecution at both the Treblinka death camp and the Sobibor death camp. Well, the Sobibor charge stuck, as they say, and Demjanjuk was convicted. He was a guard at that infamous camp and at a number of other Nazi camps as well. 
The Munich court validated the evidence that, that we and our dedicated German colleagues had amassed against Demjanjuk over the years, and that's very gratifying. Demjanjuk's story is a 34-year saga of investigation and litigation on three continents, and time certainly doesn't permit me even to tell the tale in summary fashion. Fortunately, most of you are already familiar with it. By the way, many of you will recall that in April 2009, when we first tried to remove Demjanjuk to Germany, he claimed that he was too ill uh, and that his life would be imperiled by a transatlantic flight on a medevac plane that we had chartered for him. Uh, as shown uh, in video that the family shot, every time the U.S. government physician uh, touched him during a pre-flight examination, he cried out in pain. It was only when we introduced surveillance video that had been shot by our wonderful, brilliant colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement that showed Demjanjuk going to an appointment, walking, uh, talking, uh, and even uh, 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 joking with people after he had had to be carried out on a stretcher in full view of the press from his home looking like he had one foot already in the grave. It was only then that the Court of Appeals in Cincinnati uh, uh, allowed us to remove him to Germany. You've all seen him on television and in the newspapers on trial in, in Germany. He's in a wheel, he was in a wheelchair, his mouth agape, again, looking like, like uh, 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 he had one, one foot at least uh, in the grave. What you haven't seen, because it's only been published uh, in Germany's largest newspaper, is the footage that they shot, the, 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 film, the, the, the photos that they shot uh, shortly after Demjanjuk was released, following his conviction, released pending the results of his appeal, and once again, he's walking. There is no wheelchair, there is no assistance, there is not even a cane. Uh, Mr. Demjanjuk has, for many, many years, tried to make a mockery of the legal process uh, here and in Germany, uh, and I would contrast uh, his behavior uh, with that of Sobibor death camp survivors, people like Thomas Blatt and Philip Bialowicz, who testified in the Munich trial with great courage and with great dignity. Of course, the, the so-called biological solution to the Nazi cases will soon bring these prosecutions to an end. However, there's much work to be done in cases of post-World War II human rights violations. Just as Nazi criminal, criminals fled to this country, so have perpetrators from other conflicts. With our colleagues at Immigration and Customs Enforcement, the FBI, the U.S. Attorney's offices around the country, my agency has been vigorously pursuing justice in these cases as, as well. We can already point to major successes, among them the conviction in Florida of Charles Taylor Jr., the son of former Liberian President Charles Taylor, for acts of torture carried out in Liberia. This was the first ever prosecution of an individual under the federal torture statute. A and following his conviction, he was sentenced to a 97-year term of imprisonment. His father, by the way, is currently on trial in The Hague. There was also the case of Bojo Yosepovic, prosecuted by our colleagues at ICE in a deportation case, based on proof that my office amassed, establishing that Yosepovic committed mass murder of Bosnian Muslims during the violence that uh, followed the breakup of the former Yugoslavia. There's also the case of uh, Stephen Green, one of our own, uh, a former uh, army soldier in Iraq, who we proved raped a 14-year-old girl, Abir Qasam al-Yanabi, and then murdered her and her entire family while he was serving in Iraq. Uh, he was sentenced to life imprisonment. One of our uh, most recent and important victories was achieved last year uh, when we won the conviction on naturalization fraud charges of Gilberto Hordan, who by his own admission took part in the 1982 massacre by Guatemalan military personnel of the inhabitants of the village of Dos Eres, Guatemala. Uh, innocent people. In fact, uh, Hordan admitted when we questioned him with ICE that he touched off the massacre by throwing a live baby down a deep, dry well and killing it. Uh, Mr. Hordan is currently serving a substantial term of imprisonment in Florida. So uh, the work continues in these important human rights cases, including our remaining World War II Nazi cases. Uh, I've often been asked, especially uh, with regard to the Nazi cases, why continue prosecuting these people, uh, especially the senior citizen defendants. Whatever they did before coming here happened long ago. Uh, they're not a threat to the public. They're not killing anybody anymore, uh, not persecuting anyone anymore. Well, I mean, think there, there are many compelling answers that, that one could give. First, you know, we are, after all, enforcing U.S. law. Employing those same laws 
uh, our government deports every single year many thousands of people, mostly to Latin America with Hispanic names, and mostly for the sole offense of being here without proper documentation. Would it not be hypocritical of our government to deport all of those people, but give a pass to others who violated U.S. immigration and citizenship laws after participating in human rights crimes? Uh, I'd also submit that those of the surviving victims uh, uh, who've made new homes in this country ought not be forced to share their adopted homeland with their former tormentors. And yes, instances have actually arisen in which vi surviving victims in this country have accidentally encountered their perpetrators um, in the United States. Uh, those surviving victims should no longer have to live in fear. This country has a proud history of offering haven to the oppressed, not sanctuary to the oppressors. The victims are entitled to see their country pursue justice on their behalf. Finally, though, uh, and arguably most important, it's imperative to continue pursuing these cases to send a strong message of deterrence. Would-be perpetrators of human rights crimes need to know that they will be pursued no matter how far they flee from the scenes of the crimes, even all the way to the United States, and that they will also be pursued for however long it takes, that even if they manage to avoid uh, detection into old age, they will still have to worry about the possibility of apprehension. I'd like to think that somewhere a potential participant in an atrocity will recall having once seen on television maybe a gray-haired war crimes defendant being hauled into court here or in Germany or somewhere else, and that he or she will decide, you know, it's not really worth the risk. I'm not going to participate. Uh, thus, through these cases, uh, we at the Department of Justice, I believe, uh, make a contribution to the worldwide effort to end impunity and replace it with a regime of accountability for human rights crimes, to realize the dream, really, of Justice Robert H. Jackson, beginning with his work at Nuremberg. This work is a high priority for Attorney General Holder, for Lanny Brewer, the head of the Justice Department Criminal Division, for Steve Delbach and other U.S. attorneys around the country, and of course for the women and men of the Human Rights and Special Prosecution Section, which is headed by an accomplished champion of justice on behalf of the victims of human rights, uh, human rights crimes, uh, Teresa McHenry. Thank you so much for your kind attention, and I look forward to taking your questions. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we are listening to a Friday forum featuring Eli Rosenbaum, Director of the United States Department of Justice's Office of Special Investigations. We'll return to our speaker in a moment for our traditional City Club questions. We encourage you to start formulating your questions now and would respectfully ask you to keep them brief and to the point so we can get as many questions in as possible. Members and guests alike are welcome to attend City Club forums, and we certainly hope that everyone listening will join the City Club in the coming year as we celebrate our 100th anniversary. We welcome all of you here and those listening to WCPN 90.3 FM, WCLV, WTAM, or one of the many radio stations across the country. Our television broadcast partner is WVIZ PBS IdeaStream. Television broadcasts of the City Club are made possible by Cleveland State University and PNC and our live webcast is supported by the University of Akron. We are pleased to welcome guests today at tables hosted by Baker and Hostetler and the Robert H. Jackson Center. Thank you for joining us today. Today's program is the annual Laura and L. Siegel Endowed Forum made possible by a generous gift from Mr. and Mrs. Siegel. They are seated at the head table today. Will you please stand and be recognized? Thank you very much for your strong support of the City Club. Now we would like to return to our speaker for a traditional City Club question and answer period. We welcome questions from everyone here in the audience, including guests. Holding their microphones today is City Club Program Director Kerry Miller and City Club intern Joe Andre. First question, please. Mr. Roseblue, uh, I re recently read a book about the atrocities in Japanese war camps and frankly it was interesting because I never thought of all the potential criminals and 
the horror that came. I'd like you to comment about what, if any, efforts that have been made with respect to Japanese war criminals who've got into this country and the like. You know, uh, when our office, my former office, was created in 1979, uh, the responsibility we were given related to perpetrators of crimes of persecution under the leadership of Nazi Germany and its allies. Well, Imperial Japan was certainly one of Nazi Germany's allies, and so we interpreted that assignment to cover Japanese crimes. There wasn't large-scale immigration to the United States from Japan after World War II as, as there was from Europe, and we've actually um, never encountered a credible allegation that Japanese perpetrators came here. However, uh, a big part of our work in the first 20 to 25 years uh, was keeping uh, these perpetrators out of the United States. For the most part, if they were coming here, they were coming as, as, as visitors. And uh, you'll recall that database of 70,000 names I mentioned. Well, I'm, I'm happy to report that the vast majority of those 70,000 names came back negative when we checked them through domestic records. These people were not living here. And we took nearly all of the ones that came back negative and we added them to the watch list. Nearly all of the names in our database, uh, alas, are uh, European suspects. The reason there are very few Japanese uh, is that Japan alone uh, among the governments of the world from which we've requested uh, archival access has not uh, granted us that access. So there wasn't very much that, that we were able to do. And it's one of the, in, in a job that is suffused with frustration, that is one of the, the larger ones. We did, however, st I should add finally, uh, stop uh, several uh, uh, individuals who were involved uh, in uh, the mass rapes uh, through the so-called Comfort Women program run by the Japanese military, we were able to identify them, and uh, when they attempted to come to the United States, we, we, we blocked that. Yes, sir. In identifying suspects, uh, how broad is your reach been uh, for uh, culpability purposes? Do you look, is it sufficient that this person belonged to a certain police unit or this person was, in fact, a guard at a camp? Or is there some action more than just being present, being in the unit uh, that you look to? Uh, I, I think um, uh, the answer is that we are interested in their activities. Now, sometimes those activities can be established through uh, facts about uh, the unit in which they served and how the, the members of that unit were deployed. But it's always a function of what the, these individuals actually did, uh, and the inquiry is designed to determine whether they participated in Axis-sponsored acts of persecution. Otherwise, it, it, we're speaking, of course, now of the World War II cases, otherwise we're not interested. Uh, Mr. Rosenbaum, over here. Um, as I'm sure you know, during the war, the FBI and the Justice Department were very active in uh, prosecuting going after the German Bund. My question is, uh, what, if anything, has been done to prosecute some of them who were still very vir uh, virulent and vicious some years after the war? Uh, I have to confess that I, I don't know anything about that subject. Uh, whatever law enforcement work there that was done in the 1940s took place before I was even born. Uh, but I, I do well uh, remember from my reading that there was a great deal of law enforcement activity uh, focused uh, on the, um, uh, these, these Bund organizations uh, before and during the war. Thank you. Uh, two um, quick questions. One, I'm curious whether you've ever felt that you were physically in danger of from people that knew that you were, you know, after them, and did you feel that you or your family were physically in danger? And the second part is, I'm curious whether you feel that young attorneys in their 20s or their 30s, are they as interested in these human rights issues? Are they less interested, more interested? And what do you see as their focus? Because I imagine it has to be a passion um, to spend the years that you have in following this. 
Well, my, my standard jocular answer to the first question is I deal with the dangers uh, uh, by having my wife open the mail and start the car, but that, that's not true. <laughs> that is a vicious lie. Uh, there, um, uh, there, are th there have been occasional threats throughout the years. In the Artukovich case, uh, the OSI attorney uh, who was handling it uh, was the subject of a threat from a uh, Croatian uh, emigre uh, terrorist group. Uh, and uh, the FBI informed him that if they sought to kill him, they, you know, they would make the attempt if they wanted him dead because they had killed Yugoslav officials all over the world uh, and that, unfortunately, they could not offer him 24-7 protection, so he had to take some measures that, uh, as a Vietnam Marine combat vet, he was in a reasonably good position to take. Um, there have been occasional... Uh, dangerous, but, uh, you know, comes with the job. I don't know what else we, we can say. Th thank God uh, nothing has, has actually uh, happened. Uh, as far as the, um, the young people who apply to work in our new section, uh, it, it's really an inspiration. There has been a great burst of interest in uh, law schools uh, around the country and around the world in uh, human rights enforcement work. I think that is mostly a result of the end of the Cold War uh, in the early part of the last decade, uh, which made it possible for uh, East-West international co cooperation to resume for the first time since Nuremberg in pursuing the perpetrators of crimes against humanity. For the first time, uh, you've got uh, leading perpetrators on the run from the uh, Hague Tribunal for the former Yugoslavia, the Rwanda Tribunal, the International Criminal Court, and, and, and the like. And this has really um, uh, inspired uh, law students, and we get uh, fan fabulous, fabulous uh, uh, applicants for this work. Uh, at the beginning of your talk today, you mentioned uh, 1974, I believe, as a key date in the establishment of the offices that prosecute uh, criminals, war criminals. Uh, World War II, of course, ended in 1945, which was a 34-year gap before that time. Was there any particular reason why it took so long to establish uh, an office such as yours? And uh, as a result of that delay, do you think that any uh, war criminals uh, escape uh, prosecution? Uh, I know for a fact that a great number of uh, war criminals uh, did get away because of the inordinate delay in uh, launching a, a serious, comprehensive federal effort to identify these people and attempt to secure a, a measure of justice in their cases uh, because We've seen the files, you know, uh, great, great suspects whom we almost certainly could have prosecuted, but they died before the 1979 uh, creation of our office. Why did it take so long? Well, I think the main reason was that when the Immigration Service had responsibility for these cases, and they, in fact, brought a number of them in the 1950s, the early 60s, nearly all of the cases were lost. And the uh, impression set in in the Justice Department, of which the Immigration Service was a component, that these cases are just too hard. You can't win them, uh, f including for some of the reasons that I mentioned. The crimes took place long ago on the other side of the Atlantic. You don't have, you know, witnesses t tended to be murdered in the, in the uh, commission of the crimes, et cetera. Uh, and so people despaired of, of winning these cases. Uh, I think that was the major reason. Uh, another reason was that um, a good deal of the, the best evidence had been captured by Soviet forces when they retook the Baltic countries, uh, when they pushed the Germans out of, out of Poland uh, and other places. And during the, um, the, the heyday of the Cold War in particular, uh, there was great reluctance on the part of the U.S. government to deal with the Soviet authorities on these cases and to trust any evidence that they would share with us. Uh, things changed in the 1970s uh, for a variety of reasons. I, I don't pretend to, to know all of them. Per perhaps it was partly a function of the detente that the Nixon administration had, had, uh, had worked on uh, with respect to the Soviet Union. Um, but finally, uh, uh, the realization set in 
that if you want to have any hope of winning these cases, you can't dabble in them. You can't have an immigration office in Tucson, Arizona do a case, and then another one in Boston, Massachusetts. You have to assemble a cadre of people who can specialize in these unique cases, develop the unusual uh, skills, historical and legal skills, that one needs to prevail. That turned out to be the key, and since that time, uh, the results are, are there to be seen. Hello, Mr. Rosenbaum. Um, in the context of removal and deportation being the exclusive remedies available to you for a lot of these defendants, I am hoping that you can speak a little bit about the process of coordinating with foreign jurisdictions, and particularly how you proceed where their enforcement authorities either disagree with you about the identity of a person or don't agree about the weight of the evidence or even if you're convinced that they won't allocate the resources to pursue the person. Actually, I would say that uh, in my uh, decades-long career working on these cases, the, the biggest single frustration has been the uh, non receptivity, the non-interest uh, on the part of European governments, for the most part, uh, in uh, bringing these people to justice and even accepting them into their territories when we are seeking to remove them. Time and again, European countries have said no when we are trying to return one of their former nationals who participated in Nazi crimes. Uh, I will tell you that in the Demiano case, he had been ordered removed to, uh, to Ukraine or if Ukraine wouldn't uh, accept him, Germany or Poland. Ukraine said no. Poland said no. Germany said no. And I was made to understand by one of Demyanyuk's attorneys that this was exactly what they expected and sort of, uh, you know, backhanded congratulations to you. You won all the legal batters, battles, but you'll never get him out of here because no one's going to take him. And it was only when uh, some very, very... Uh, gifted and dedicated investigative judges went to work on the Nazi cases in Germany, people who had a heart, who understood what these cases were about and looked into the Demianyuk case, that things changed. And finally, uh, Demianyuk was indicted in Germany, which really made it impossible for the uh, political authorities in Berlin to continue saying, well, we won't accept him. After all, he's wanted in Germany. The disagreements that we have with uh, foreign jurisdictions generally don't involve the weight of the evidence, uh, except when they uh, say to us, look, under our law, perhaps, uh, we uh, would not be able to prosecute uh, as, as you do in the United States. Sometimes that's true. Sometimes it's not true. Uh, the, biggest, the biggest problem is simply getting uh, to yes, getting them to say, we will, we will accept the return of this person. The question I was going to ask you, but uh, what now with Demoniak? What kind of time frame? Who is funding his defense? And as a sidebar, is the lack of the United States being a, an active member of the international court affected your ability to carry out your job? Wow. Great questions. Uh, thank you, Vic, for a lot of things, including that question. Uh, you know, Demianyuk uh, has been convicted in Germany. Uh, he was sentenced to a five-year term of imprisonment, from which they deduct the two years that uh, he was already confined in Germany uh, before and during the trial. Uh, under their system, I'm told he has uh, perhaps a year and a half uh, to uh, spend in jail if his sentence uh, is confirmed on appeal, upheld on appeal. Uh, under their system, uh, he has been released pending the results of that appeal. That's not the way things happen in the United States, uh, but I'm told it's, it's all being done in accordance with uh, common procedure in Germany. So he is, uh, for the moment, uh, free in Germany, and we'll have to wait and see what happens uh, in, his, uh, in his appeal. As far as the ICC is concerned, not only are we not a member of the ICC, but there is a federal statute, the American Service Members Protection Act, that prohibits uh, federal employees, federal officials, from assisting the ICC in any way. So to the extent that, um, uh, you know, perhaps the ends of justice could be pursued in one or another case through cooperation with the ICC for the moment, that's, that's not going to happen. But I think uh, we've seen, beginning with the, the latter part of the uh, uh, George W. Bush administration and certainly uh, during the current administration, 
um, a, a, a growing comfort level with the ICC and cooperation uh, after a fashion in, in various ways. So we'll see. Stay tuned. Oh, who's funding, sorry, who's funding Demyanyuk's defense? He had a court-appointed lawyer in Germany uh, and also a lawyer that uh, was privately engaged. Whether that lawyer was paid and if so, by whom, I, I don't know. Mr. Rosenbaum, over the years, the Argentine has been a kind of a safe haven place for Nazis. Are they clean now? <laughs> I, I don't know who's clean and who's not anymore, but uh, uh, a number of very, very heavily implicated Nazi criminals um, uh, were able to get to Argentina, absolutely. Uh, most notoriously, Adolf Eichmann, uh, who delivered millions of, of Jews to the Nazi extermination camps. Uh, this, by the way, is the uh, 50th anniversary of the Eichmann trial in Jerusalem, and I, I had the great privilege uh, in uh, Virginia last uh, month at the Virginia Holocaust Museum to uh, be there when uh, Gabriel Bach, the only surviving prosecutor of the Eichmann trial, uh, spoke about his experiences at the trial. Uh, I don't think there are uh, many, if any, Nazi criminals uh, still remaining in Argentina. The date, of course, is very late. One was found there about 10 or 12 years ago. Um, but it, uh, it seems unlikely at this point, but who knows? Yes, you mentioned in your speech about uh, Dr. Rudolph, who is the inventor of the V-2 missile and various other satellite missiles. Because so many scientists went to Russia and did not come to the United States, about half of them, uh, what kind of cooperation do we have with the Soviet Union in bringing those criminals to justice? Interesting. Uh, of course, the Soviet Union is, is no more. Um, they were not in the business of exposing uh, Nazi pasts of people they were using, uh, but certainly uh, all the Allied powers did this. The Americans, the British, the French, the Soviets, uh, everybody had their own Nazis. Uh, and that's a, a terrible legacy uh, of the Cold War. The only real victors, at least in the first decades of the Cold War, were probably the Nazi criminals who managed to play the two sides off against one another. Thank you for coming. You mentioned that the coverage on John Demyanyuk has been exhaustive and exhausting for most of us who've been in Cleveland for decades. Um, it has been uh, inflammatory in many cases, mm -hmm. controversial. Is there anything, should you look back over the last 20 years of coverage or so, so that you could say the Justice Department might have done differently or might have contributed to to balance out the kind of coverage that most of us have experienced and shaken our heads at? You know, uh, all prosecutors uh, have advantages in their work. For one thing, we appear before juries, and I think we tend to get the benefit of the doubt. We represent the American people, and the, 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 the defendant is, we claim, a perpetrator of some crime. And we also have our disadvantages, and one of them is that we generally can't speak about our cases until they're over. And so I really have had hardly a word to say about the Demyanyuk case for 10 years now. Uh, this is one of the very first instances in which I, I'm, I'm able to speak about it because the case is now finally uh, over, at least from our, our perspective. I guess he has his appeal, but uh, that hasn't even been filed yet as far as I know. Uh, in that case, uh, I wish that we could have spoken out uh, more often about some of the things that were going on uh, that uh, the public doesn't know about to this very day. Some of the, the press coverage that was, as you say, not only inflammatory but, but wrong. Uh, without going into great detail, I, I would point to uh, the, the uh, wire service report of, of, of this past April just a month before uh, Demyanyuk, uh, before the court in Munich was to decide the, uh, the Demyanyuk case. And uh, it was issued over the wire service headline, FBI thought Demyanyuk evidence faked. And they cited some FBI documentation that they had obtained at the National Archives, documentation that was available to Demyanyuk's lawyers uh, long before. 
uh, certainly in time to use it in, in Germany. Uh, the German court wasn't interested in any of this, but th they could have used it, uh, I suppose. Anyway, uh, when you look at the documentation, that's not what it says. It's the speculation of one FBI agent in Cleveland that maybe the Soviets had sought to frame someone, frame Demyanyuk, and that maybe they have a policy of identifying what the agent called outspoken dissidents and fabricating Nazi documents um, and providing them to the Americans and then barring uh, authorities in the United States from testing these documents, thereby guaranteeing that their political opponents would lose their court cases. That's interesting speculation. Uh, unfortunately, this agent didn't bother to learn anything about the case. Had he done homework, had he read The Plain Dealer, maybe, had he read the published decision in the Demyanyuk case, he would know that, uh, for one thing, Mr. Demyanyuk was never an outspoken dissident. He was an obscure, quiet assembly line worker for the Ford Motor Company. He would know, he would have known, had he read the decision, that the document was uh, offered to the United States for testing, that is, the Soviets permitted it to be tested, the, what was then the key document in the case. There are many other documents now. Documents come from Western world and the former Soviet Union. Um, but the United States government tested it, as the judge wrote in his opinion. It was offered to the, to the defense to test, and they declined to do it. Um, so, I mean, this report hit like a bombshell in Germany. Defense counsel made a lot of noise about it. Uh, and it was very odd, um, again, because they had it, because it's just the surmise of, of an FBI agent. Um, and what I, what I puzzled over as I looked at this document was, gee, why does this FBI agent refer to the uh, Treblinka death camp as having been a prison camp? It wasn't a prison camp. It was a death camp. Over 700,000 men, women, and children were murdered there just as of December 31, 1942, and killing operations continued into 43. Why would he call it a prison camp? That, that seemed odd to me. And then uh, we looked at the rest of the file, and it started to make sense. It made sense because a few months earlier, a man by the name of Jerome Brentar, perhaps known to some of you, who operated a uh, travel agency here, uh, and was one of America's leading Holocaust deniers and anti-Semites, showed up at FBI Cleveland offices with a, a former SS man in tow and regaled the agent with tales of Soviet uh, uh, misconduct and all the stuff that had already been rejected by uh, federal judges. And what can I say? The agent bought it hook, line, and sinker. But these things... Until now, I couldn't talk about. Uh, bringing us to a more contemporary conflict in uh, Libya uh, mm -hmm. that started with uh, a massacre at the Abu Salim prison outside of Benghazi, about 1,200 people killed. Uh, Secretary Clinton has talked about uh, mass rapings throughout the country, and the uh, Berber uh, in the western part of the country have been targeted by the Gaddafi regime uh, for weeks now. How do you see your office uh, interacting with the aftermath of the Libyan conflict once it's over with? Well, uh, you know, uh, the experience that we've had as a nation is that following violent conflicts like that, uh, perpetrators flee to the four corners of the earth, and the United States being one of the most generous, probably the most generous country in the world from an immigration standpoint, ends up being home uh, to some number of perpetrators from virtually every significant conflict. Uh, we work very hard with our partners at the State Department, uh, the uh, FBI, the intelligence community, to try to identify those people, to keep them out of the United States, but if we find them here, uh, to um, investigate and pr pursue justice as, as, as well as we can. We definitely have our eyes on what's going on in Libya and some other hotspots, and potential hotspots. Today at the City Club of Cleveland, we've been listening to a Friday forum featuring Eli Rosenbaum, Director of the United States Department of Justice's Office of Special Investigations. Thank you very much, Mr. Rosenbaum. Thank you, ladies and gentlemen. This forum is now adjourned.
For information on upcoming speakers or for podcasts of the City Club, go to cityclub.org.